Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, P2P, the Peer-to-Peer -peer Support Teams webinar. Um, this is part of our Humanitarian Leadership Series, which is a webinar that is undertaken on a monthly basis focused on bringing field perspectives um, with practical examples um, of how leadership has been put in place in action. Uh, this webinar will focus um, on uh, local actors as equal and strategic partners. My name is Ingram McDonald and I'm a director with the Peer-to-Peer -peer Support Team um, and I will be your host today. Um, our webinar will last for one hour and 15 minutes. Um, the webinar will be divided into two parts. The first part will have half of the speakers uh, will be dedicated to the speakers having um, questions that will be put to them where they will outline some of the practical steps that they have taken to um, um, uh, support local actors as equal and strategic partners and the second half will be focused on question and answers that will come from your you as the audience. I would therefore like to encourage you to please send through any questions that you have on this topic which is a very interesting, broad, dynamic and relevant topic um, because you can send them to us. Uh, in the right hand corner you'll notice that you have two functions. You have both a chat function and you also have a Q&A function. The Q&A function will go to us as the presenters or the hosts um, or you can actually have a chat amongst yourselves uh, which is also quite useful in terms of uh, the different issues. So, so please go ahead and use those. Um, after the webinar we will have produce a summary that summary will uh, be sent to all of the, the presenters um, as well as all of the audience. The summary is also will be available on our website along with all of the other webinars we've had. So I would encourage you to have a look at deliveraidbetter.org where you will find all the different um, webinars that we have done over the various years on these practical issues. You will also be able to listen on our YouTube site um, to the to a recording of the webinar later if you would like to or you can encourage other colleagues in your offices or in your locations to to listen if you think there is relevant information there I'd also like to point to that you will see now on your screen there is an opening poll um, it takes about 30 seconds to do this poll what it does is it allows us to improve the quality of our webinars in the future and you can put forward um, information about yourselves and also about ideas that may, you may have for the future that helps us improve this, this series. So today's webinar, as I said, is about local actors as equal and strategic partners. Um, the, uh, the, we are privileged today to have three distinguished speakers. We have the Deputy Regional Humanitarian Coordinator for the Syria Crisis, Ramesh Radhasangam. Um, Ramesh has had a long and distinguished career um, in many different of the humanitarian hotspots in the world. Um, he's been in Syria for the last uh, year or so. Before that he was in Palestine as the head of the OCHA office um, as well as uh, running the largest um, uh, OCHA office in the world in Sudan. Um, he also was the, appointed with the Secretary General um, to review the Ebola response and has had a variety of other um, uh, uh, placements including within uh, OCHA at headquarters working on IDP and protracted situations. We also have Virginie Lefre who is with the Amal Association International in Lebanon. Virginie has worked for many years, um, over 10 years with uh, NGOs in the field both from a humanitarian and development perspective. Uh, she is a jurist um, and she is also someone who has been very active through her work uh, looking at um, issues of um, localization and how to support national NGOs in many different forums and processes, uh, north-south partnerships as well as within the international humanitarian system and in places like the Grand Bargain. Um, we also have Ms. Halima Ali Adam who is the gender-based violence subcluster coordinator in Somalia and she is also the project coordinator for Save Somali Women and Children in Somalia. She manages a comprehensive service provision program assisting victims of gender-based violence um, in areas such as providing counselling, medical and legal assistance. She's also been a very active and dynamic member of um, 
the coordination system in Somalia for quite a long time and, will, and can bring forward some very relevant lessons learned in terms of how to bring forward things to the um, to the um, humanitarian country team. Um, we have uh, also um, the so in terms of this issue today, in terms of localization, what we what we would like to really bring forward is there's been quite a lot of work done on this in terms of the grand bargain, in terms of uh, at the global level, but also at the local level. As you know, the P2P support team, we do a lot of support with humanitarian coordinators and humanitarian country teams in the field. This issue has routinely come up as a very important area where there is a need to focus more, recognizing that local actors are, are, are often the first responders as well as the ones who stay there and it is often the, they are from the country or the crisis and they bring many distinct advantages such as understanding the culture, understanding the practicalities and also um, language and, and, and uh, many other elements. However, it also comes with a variety of challenges, such as concerns around whether you can actually have a principled approach with uh, local actors, and also the issue of duty of care and risk management, and of course, a very important issue, which is the issue of funding and capacity enhancement. So our speakers today will be bringing forward some their experience of how this has been taken up practically from a field level to match some of those high level commitments that have been made in the grand bargain where we there is all the big uh, or actors such as the UN and NGOs and some of the main donors came together and recognised that it was a time to look at how we could have a response, a humanitarian response that was as international as it necessary but as local as possible. So to start off the discussion, I'd like to first go to Virginie um, to, to put forward um, a question to her in terms of the, um, uh, her experience of how have local actors um, in the setting where she is working, how has she ensured that the voice and exper expertise have been put forward as part of a collective humanitarian response at all level, especially in the areas of strategic decision making? How has this been facilitated by other parts of the system, and especially the role of the HC and the HCT in your area? Over to you, Virginie. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. Uh, so I'd like first to thank you and the peer, uh, to peer support team for inviting me to join uh, this webinar. Um, I guess that as the, the partnerships coordinator of the Lebanese uh, National NGO, um, this uh, issue of equality and local partners uh, particularly speak to me and to my uh, experience. So um, to start off with, um, how do we ensure the inclusion of, of local NGO perspectives in the collective humanitarian response? I guess there's not one single uh, response to that particular question, but I'll try to uh, provide you with some input based on my particular experience in Lebanon. For me, the first thing is to uh, ensure from, from our perspective, from the perspective of, of local NGO, a coordinated voice through uh, different uh, networks. Um, the example I have for Lebanon is the, the Lebanese Local NGO Forum, which is an informal platform of 25 uh, local NGO active in the response to the, the Syria crisis. And through this particular forum, we coordinate our activities and our positions. Beyond this, uh, this local and national level, I think it's also important to, to mention that um, the coordination uh, really goes beyond the national level. There's also a need for uh, regional and international coordination. And there are different fora, such as IGVA and, and MIR, uh, which are very helpful for us as well to, to exchange uh, experiences and to coordinate our voice at the, at the international level for processes such as the grand bargain. Um, second thing uh, to ensure this inclusion, I think it's very important that local NGOs are being represented in all the coordination uh, mechanisms, which is often the case for international NGOs because they do have liaison officer, they do have cluster specialists. It is less the case for uh, for international uh, for national sorry organization because we often have less capacities. So what we've been doing in Lebanon with the local NGO forum is that we mapped all those coordination mechanisms 
and we designated focal points uh, for the meetings to make sure that uh, we were present in each and single meeting and more important that we were able to reflect our priorities or to, to share information um, which were uh, resulting from, from these different meetings. Uh, the third thing is also to make sure beyond attending those meetings that uh, the, the sectoral and field expertise of local NGOs informs the, the strategic uh, decision, right? Because we don't want to, to attend just for the sake of, of attending. So, um, for instance, in Lebanon, uh, local NGO farm members have uh, designated uh, focal points for each one of, of the sectors of the, of the response so that uh, we're making sure that our field experience do inform the, the strategic planning. And we are also within that particular framework facilitating uh, the election of uh, the representatives on the steering committees and, and core groups of those different uh, sectors or clusters, if you want. I think one very important thing as well is to be uh, realistic on, on our capacity as, as local NGOs, and I mentioned it a little bit uh, before, is that we don't have, we have different capacities because of, of many reasons, uh, such as the resources we have. So we need to, um, to acknowledge that we have to share information and that we have to share our perspectives with some other stakeholders so that they can also relay our um, messages. Uh, for instance, in Lebanon, the local NGO forum regularly meets with the international NGOs forum. Uh, we do also invite donors to our meeting. Um, we are also present as an observer to the international NGO forum plenary meeting so that you know, we can make sure that we also can share our views, that those views are complementary. It's not going to be necessarily always relay in extenso, but as much as possible, we're trying that everybody is aware of our position and that we can this way inform the strategic planning process. Um, when it comes to uh, the HTT in, in particular, I think there were some very interesting um, practices um, implemented in Lebanon um, for to, I mean, to, to make sure that local NGOs were, were well represented and that they could inform the strategic planning, particularly in uh, the terms of reference of uh, the HCT, um, there is a fair representation of national NGOs and we have particularly dedicated seats for local NGOs. So it is not only a number of seats of NGO in the terms of reference, there's a dedicated number of seats for uh, national NGOs. And the election of these representatives is uh, being facilitated by the local NGOs forum and each six months we change uh, the representative. A similar approach, uh, even though it's not directly related to the HCT, but has been adopted for the, the country-based poll fund board, where we also facilitate the, the election. A second thing for me, which has been um, a key factor in terms of, of, a, successful, uh, of a successful position for, for national NGOs, particularly in relation with the HCT, is that um, the HCT has been quite flexible when it was coming to, to national NGO uh, participation. So for instance, when there were some sectoral or particular topic which uh, required uh, expertise from another national NGO which was not necessarily the one elected to be at the HTT, there was a lot of flexibility and there's still a lot of flexibility to have additional um, national NGO on board. And um, maybe a last point, which is a little bit more uh, technical, but I think it's also important is that uh, when, we, when we were in the process of asking for those three dedicated seats for uh, national NGOs, we uh, got in fact a lot of support from the HT, from the International NGO uh, Forum. So we were not alone advocating for this. It was really a joint, I mean, decision and advocacy process. And I, I think for sure if as a humanitarian community, we're joining our efforts to ensure that we're really there as equal partners in all these strategic processes, it makes a, a very big difference. Okay, thank you very much, Virginia. I think that you've put some really important practical steps there in terms of not only what can be done in the broader humanitarian community in terms of the need to have those dedicated seats and to have those systems and structures put in place, but also in terms of what NGOs can do themselves 
to um, ensure that they use the networks and they use other strengths and, and the collective in an effective manner. And it sounds like in Lebanon there's a lot of very practical um, uh, learnings that we can take forward. I want to I want to come now to what lessons learn the, the, the next question for you, um, which is that which is to really capitalise a little bit more on some of those lessons. So, from your perspective, what lessons learned um, are relevant for other operations from the experience that you have in Lebanon, especially in areas like representation, participation, language, and funding. These really important meaty areas that come up um, so so much. Um, okay, so first what I want to say is that all of what I'm going to say uh, can be relevant, but for me it's really important whenever we're talking about localization that we do have a contextualized approach. So what may work in Lebanon might not work somewhere else, and what might be a challenge in Lebanon might not be a challenge some, somewhere else. So I've been trying to identify a couple of, of challenges and how we, we found some very practical solution or how as a humanitarian community we found some very practical solution to overcome them and to, to ensure that uh, the, the local NGOs had their voice heard. So the first thing is, is the language. Um, it is not a real issue in Lebanon at the national level since most of the national NGO staff have, uh, do speak French or English. However, it can be a real issue at the regional or at the local level in the different coordination committees where very important strategic and field decision will be made. So um, what has been done in Lebanon is that some of the regional working groups are being held in Arabic because they gather mainly field actors and then that the inputs coming from those regional meetings are being brought at the national level where this is being discussed in, uh, in English or in French, depending on, on the meeting. So that's for, for the language thing. However, I do acknowledge that in other countries it can be quite an issue if meetings are only happening in English, but for us we found this, uh, this middle uh, solution. When it comes to participation, another issue, and I mentioned it a little bit before, is that as uh, national and local NGOs, we do not have staff dedicated to coordination. Most of the staff are doing both program and coordination and humanitarian policy and all those things. So we need to rely a lot on coordination platforms and on other NGOs, which is often not the practice among NGOs to have those you know, coordination processes. So what we've been doing in Lebanon, trying to make sure that we were able to participate, but really to participate actively, is that uh, the local NGO uh, forum focal point at the moment, I'm the focal point, but each six months we change this, this focal point. So that particular person is the one attending the national coordination meetings. So we make sure that there is really information sharing happening because most of the time the real barrier for a local NGO is that they are not aware of what's happening at the national level because they don't have anyone who's available to attend the meetings, who's available to to provide inputs for, for the meeting. So for us, participation is, is really important, also in terms of information sharing. Um, in terms of uh, representation, I think that it is also important to, um, to mention that uh, we need to be there in, in different mechanisms. And I mentioned it in my, in my previous, uh, previous part of my, my intervention that it was important for us to be there on different uh, committees. Why? Not only to be there, but also to avoid the risk of duplication, to make sure that operations of local NGOs are really being known and are really informing the planning processes. So we need to have complementarity. What we've been doing in Lebanon to ensure, again, this complementarity is that we make sure that we have at least one local NGO attending the planification meeting, again, to share information, but also an, an additional thing is that we are developing, we developed an internal mapping to make sure that we were not duplicating internally our intervention, right? Because often what local NGOs are, are complaining about and it's, it's happening is that international actors would, would duplicate their intervention because they're not aware of what's being done. So we need to inform them about what's being done uh, in different meetings, but we also need to make sure that we're not duplicating among ourselves what, uh, what the others are doing. 
Now, funding, you, you mentioned it, Ingrid, and I think that's, uh, that's really important, right? It's, uh, it's a key to have uh, uh, national NGOs and local NGOs as, as equal partners. Um, but it's not only about getting the money funding, it's also about getting direct contacts with the donors and with the partners. Because uh, apart from applying for call for proposal, what's really important is that the priorities of those calls for proposal would respond to the field reality. So what we've been doing to ensure this direct relationship, which is often not happening for many local and small NGOs, is that uh, first thing, we make sure that we share all funding opportunities and all you know, potential meetings with donors between all of us, between all local NGOs, but also we do invite donors to our uh, local NGO plenary meetings so that those small NGOs who often do not have opportunity to interact directly with donors have an opportunity to interact with donors. Um, then also in terms of funding, I think that one other interesting practice is not something we've been doing, but something we've been doing jointly with other actors of the system, is that uh, we're contributing, we're facilitating the election of the, of the local NGO representative at the board of the Lebanon Humanitarian Fund, the country-based pool fund, right? And I think that's also very important because there we have our voice and it's a dedicated seat for a local NGO. And then um, I think also uh, in terms of complementarity, what's really important, and then uh, we have a practice for this particular thing in Lebanon, is that AMEL and also different other national NGOs um, are leading humanitarian projects with long-term partners. And I feel that is, that is very important in Lebanon, is that we are living with this, with this permanent crisis since 40 years, so we're used to work with the same partners. And this is really a real contribution for, for equality when you have partners that, that you trust, being UN, being international NGOs. So such relationships uh, with the partners who share the same vision are for me the real localization because this is really complementarity. It's not only about us doing everything, it's not only about the other doing everything, it's about us doing things uh, together. And this is really, I think, uh, contributing to, um, as the, the crisis becomes increasingly protracted um, in Lebanon, it really helps us for the definition, implementation of exit strategies, or at least discussing them, um, requesting for technical support, mentoring, also this direct interaction with donors when it comes to exit strategies. So really there, I think this, this complementarity and this equal or at least fair partnership is really a key for, uh, for local and national NGOs to, uh, to overcome the, the barriers they may have in informing and impacting the, the different uh, planning or strategic processes. Okay, thank you very much, Virginia. I think you gave us some really very um, relevant steps that can be taken there from both the ensuring that even though there are global learnings, they should be contextualized um, the issue of language, the issue of resources, the issue of funding, but also about how to use the collective more effectively in terms of building on where the strengths are of the different um, national actors and then how we can engage better with the donors and, and do some of that uh, very practical work that you're, you're talking about across the system. So I'd like to go over to now to um, the Deputy uh, Regional Humanitarian Coordinator for the Syria Crisis, uh, Ramesh Radasangam, he will be, um, I mean, the, the, the humanitarian operation that Mr. Radasangam is um, coordinating is quite a, a, a unique, complicated, diverse um, uh, operation which really has a very high dominance in terms of local actors. So this is, a, is, is very relevant for our discussion today. Um, if it wasn't for local actors, it's debatable that that, that that operation could actually could work the way it is. And so as the Deputy Regional Humanitarian Coordinator, um, what steps, concrete steps, have you taken, um, Mr. Radasangam, in terms of together with members of your humanitarian um, leadership group to put in place a collective system-wide approach to supporting local actors as equal, principled and strategic partners within the cross-border response to the Syria crisis? 
Thanks, uh, Ingrid. Uh, thanks very much, Nisa. Indeed, a pleasure to be here. And uh, apologies to you and to everyone else on this line for my lateness. Um, I know I've got a limited time, so let me just perhaps uh, quickly shoot through. I think it's important to know the context in which we're working, this unique context that you mentioned. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit in the beginning, very briefly, about the evolution of uh, Syrian NGOs. And forgive me if I keep calling Syrian NGOs as opposed to local actors, because that's the terminology we've used, and it'll take me a while to, to shift that. Anyway, um, civil society was basically non-existent before the crisis in Syria in 2011. Um, it was virtually impossible to establish a civil society organization there then. However, after the crisis broke out, there's been a rapid growth, both in terms of the volume and sophistication of these uh, um, uh, civil society organizations, but outside the country. And I'll come to the reason why. So today, currently, we have hundreds of them operating from Turkey, and it has truly been uh, an extraordinary uh, evolution. There's a, a, it's a $1 billion cross-border operation from Turkey, uh, with uh, NGOs, or, and particularly Syrian NGOs, uh, providing most of that support. So the bulk of the support in this cross-border operation comes from uh, these uh, Syrian NGOs. They provide relief and services, uh, and the latter is the most important, uh, because in the absence of uh, government ministry services, such as health, education, water and sanitation facilities, it's these NGOs that are doing this, and they're doing it with uh, in, um, increasing expertise. Uh, in addition, for example, they, they build, they maintain, they run staffing and uh, equipping and uh, uh, of infrastructure such as hospitals, uh, water systems, uh, education facilities, etc. Just in July, for example, you know, they, they performed over 10,000 trauma operations. Uh, they, they attended outpatients, almost a million uh, outpatient visits. Uh, so these are extraordinary numbers that you don't normally see in, in, a, in a normal humanitarian context. Um, the area of operation that we are working on is obviously in opposition-held areas. We're not in the government-held areas. Uh, and this is particularly in, um, mainly in Idlib, but it also does reach out to some of the other uh, provinces in Turkey. Uh, in terms of status, they are, op they are registered in Turkey, not in Damascus. And this, has, this will have and does have serious protection implications to them, because in some cases they're seen as illegal entities and then therefore illegal workers. Um, and the last thing on this context is that it's a remote out coordination operation. So it's the, it's the local NGOs that are actually doing the work on the ground, but coordination systems are basically outside. Now, in terms of the, uh, the engagement and inclusion of what we've done uh, with, uh, to support the Syrian NGOs and the local NGOs uh, in this operation, is I think it's, it's good to bring that to two different uh, uh, periods. One is the pre-UN Security Council resolution, which came in July 2014 which, as you know, is the cross-border operation, which permitted uh, the UN to send assistance uh, to, through two Syria borders with the, through, through border, excuse me, two border points with the Syria, uh, Bab al and Bab al um, without, which in, in many ways helps us to overcome the issue with the sovereignty uh, of Syria. So that's been critical for the operation. Now, before that was set up, we were not really operating in uh, full steam. There was a certain NGO that were doing it. And they had set this up by themselves and with um, a lot of support from international NGOs. And I think this is important to note that a, a lot of work has been done outside of the UN framework um, by these NGOs to establish themselves. So, and as I mentioned before, it's a truly uh, extraordinary situation and one that I think we can learn from for future such situations. So in the period before the resolution, they established sector working groups by themselves and International NGOs then provide the resources and provide the coordinators for those sector groups. They also established an NGO forum, which was uh, run by international NGOs. In addition to the certain NGOs, because they have in, su in such large numbers, they themselves initiated and established networks themselves. But none of this would have been possible without the um, support of the, Syrian, of the Turkish government, which has, been, which has provided them both protection uh, permits and, and facilities to allow, allow this to happen. So the Turkish Red Crescent uh, organization, or Kizilay as it's called there, uh, has been instrumental in, in providing facilitation for cross-border operations of NGOs. To date, they facilitate the crossing of, I think, over 35,000 trucks uh, into Idlib and uh, Aleppo alone. Now, when, when just before the, the Security Council resolution was passed, uh, Archer and some of the UN organizations are right, and then they started to help bring in the, the, the IASC coordination structure. But we must, know, we must 
as Nasser, it's difficult to introduce a new structure over an existing one, especially one that's been indigenously, indigenously established by, by partners in the DAO. Uh, the UN option, the UN established a standard trust of leadership uh, with the arrival of the agencies um, who are responsible for it at the global level. And uh, what we call the Human Liaison Group, which is in, uh, in other countries the Human Trial Team was established with representation uh, from the uh, Syrian NGOs. Now, how did um, OCHA go about doing this? And these are some of the unique things that it did, I think, which will be helpful in future operations. Uh, they provided dedicated civil service organization or, or Syrian NGO support capacity. So your two staff who are very familiar with the context, the NGOs, the language, uh, and they established a platform of bringing together the various Syrian NGO networks to, um, to engage them in the, in the coordination process. Uh, this includes, for example, the Humanitarian Information Sharing Group um, and, and the platform, as I mentioned. Now, none of this would have been possible without translation directly, um, or so what we call um, trans translation to Arabic at all the meetings. So there was um, we, we have a, a there's a translator in um, an interpreter in Ottawa who provides this at all these meetings because the bulk of the Syrian NGOs work only in Arabic and without this translation none of this would have been possible. Now, now one of them obviously funding is a critical aspect of this and the Tur the pool fund the Ottawa pool fund from Turkey has been instrumental in capacity building in helping to train and helping NGOs understand the humanity the humanitarian principles in the context of the human, the uh, coordination context in which we work. Um, last year alone, I think they disbursed almost $100 million. It's one of the largest uh, pool funds that has been instrumental in supporting national NGOs, and they've been taking the bulk of the, of the funding from that. Without this, uh, and then we'll come to it later, uh, without this, it would be very difficult for many of them to operate in a rapid way. Uh, now, in terms of the HLG, the Humanitarian Liaison Group, uh, I must note here that the most engaged partners in that, in terms of information, analysis, early warning, are the Syrian NGOs. And I think this is something that we have to also recognize and actively support in, in other such contexts. Now, finally, in terms of coordination, they do have a co-lead in some of the clusters. Uh, the, the, they are instrumental in the co-lead, including the health cluster, which has over 100 members. And it's a very sophisticated health cluster. They do things that you wouldn't normally find in other health clusters because they're talking about trauma surgery, uh, they're talking about the disease surveillance. They're basically doing the work of the ministry uh, on the ground there. Um, just to back up to the third slide, in terms of the um, assets and challenges, I'll very quickly go through this. The biggest thing, the most, the most important thing I think underpins the, uh, the assets of Syrian NGOs is the social stake they have in the crisis in the communities they serve. Uh, it's their brothers, their sisters, their families who they're helping, their communities. So that social stake uh, has been instrumental in a counterly to affect the population because it's an integral part of their work. They're constantly reminded of what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, what needs to be done. So I think that's been, uh, and we should learn from it, and I think we should use that as a channel for our own accountability to affect the populations. Their collection of information is also particularly good because obviously they know where to collect information, they can verify, they know the credibility of information, and finally they come with expertise that we may not necessarily have which is related to the local context. Um, and then secondly, the diaspora has been uh, instrumental, they've been a, they play an absolutely incredible role in terms of providing expertise, advocacy and funding to the uh, NGO uh, operations there. Now, in terms of some, just to go back to what I said before, for the service delivery, they do things that we wouldn't normally do in other human contexts. And they do it because the, the, the expertise of the Syrian NGOs is, I think, unique in, in, compared to other human contexts, such as, for example, Darfur, etc. We would not be doing, see, local NGOs in other countries may not be doing the sort of work that they do here, but that has not prevented them from going ahead and doing it. So they've created these. Um, the health uh, service system in, uh, in uh, Idlib, for example, or the education system, which is truly remarkable, and that's the one that actually provides a lot of resilience and sustains the, uh, the program there. That's because the provenance of many of these NGO workers, it actually is, comes from the health of the education sectors before the crisis. So they knew the system, they knew the curriculum, they knew how to operate it, and I think the, the more you let them go and do this, I think the, the stronger oper your, the operation is. 
So they instinctively know what is, uh, what's relief and what's resilience and what's needed. In terms of uh, innovation, it's a two-way street. Obviously, the international actors do bring standards, good practices, networks, uh, coordination and planning. But the local actors, and this is something I think we need to uh, also uh, underline here, they bring something that we don't, we don't necessarily have um, in a, in a context-driven crisis like this. So they bring context-appropriate solutions. We need to better, uh, uh, we need to better tap into that. They do bring a higher standard that goes beyond human action. And, um, and I think uh, we need to perhaps also document that better for future purposes as best practices. Um, they do have, in terms of non-traditional funding, they have access to uh, private diaspora and the gas donors, which we find particularly, to, particularly difficult to access, or we don't have the mechanisms to access some of that funding. Uh, but they do it, and consequently they are, I think, a fairly well-funded uh, uh, operation. Um, and now, in terms of the challenges, um, I think this is, these are all fairly clear, but they're quite uh, common, I think, in many of these places. Humanitarian principles and framework, it's difficult for them to go out of the old context of the work in pre-crisis into a humanitarian context where they need, it's a new environment and they aren't sure how to operate in that. So I think that's something that needs to be looked at. Uh, for risk and uh, duty of care, yes, they carry the burden of the risk. And let's face it, we're, we are transferring more of our risk to them as well, especially in remote operations. Hundreds have died in the course of their work. Um, I think what we need to do is look at the security networks that, that we can bring as perhaps good practices elsewhere to support this. INSO, for example, an international NGO, is doing a great job on this and maybe some lessons can be taken from that. But it remains a challenge. How do they, first of all, I think the risk that they take is extraordinary and none of us would take some of those risks. But at the same time, they would not take that risk. Uh, we would not be successful if they did not take those risks. So how do we provide duty of care to, to, cushion that, uh, to cushion that risk and to assist them. Um, nextly, on national and local authorities, this is a, a, a particularly thorny issue. They, they do come a lot of pressure on the ground from national and local authorities because they are Syrian and the national authorities obviously have, have political uh, affiliations. Uh, so it's difficult for them to get out of that because it, sometimes it can affect them uh, in the communities and societies in which they work. Uh, but ultimately, it's square pegs and round holes. I think our international structures and policies can at times straightjacket the operation from the Syrian side. And they, are, they struggle to work within it. So how do we program organically uh, to, uh, to uh, ensure that we, we're not forcing something down, that we're really looking at how we, we could perhaps change our way of working to more organically suit the context. And finally, uh, they have very little bilateral funding and also very little funding for overheads. And that is a, a stark problem for many of them because it's easy to get funding for, uh, easier to get funding for relief assistance. But in terms of the actual uh, overheads for the, to run the operation, that's a, 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 an unanswered question. And that takes me to my final slide um, on the outstanding questions from the, um, uh, from the grand bargain, which is basically multi-year investment in local actors' capacity, uh, removing barriers to partnership, including local actors in international coordination mechanisms. A, a wonderful goal of 25% of medical funding by 2020 for national actors uh, and a great use of pool funds. I think for the most part, I think all the last four, we've done a fairly good job uh, in, in the Turkey operation to, to address those questions and, to, uh, and to, um, to take action on them. What we are missing is the multi-year investment in local actor capacity because uh, are we ourselves are struggling with a multi-year uh, investment in human operations, and I think until we get, sort it out internally within our own uh, house, it's difficult to, to bring that to the local actors. Um, the, I think the one thing that you will find uh, that we need to address uh, profoundly and deeply is the issue of human principles. Impartiality, humanity, neutrality, and independence. I would say the first two, impartiality and humanity, are the ones that we should really try and focus on before the others. Why? Because impartiality allows us to work within the principles of doing assessments and providing, ass uh, needs, providing assistance based on needs. And humanity is a common uh, principle I think that no one finds find uh, difficult to work around. However, neutrality and independence is very difficult for national NGOs. 
Um, and, and we must recognize this and we must uh, work within this and not expect it to be a perfect situation. It's also a difficult uh, issue for international interests increasingly. Uh, so we are not often seen as being very neutral. So I think addressing that in our programming will help to, uh, to for us to better work and coordinate with the national NGOs. Last two points, uh, risk and duty of care, as I mentioned, we must do something about that. And in terms of the legal status, this is a particularly a Syrian NGO, a cross-border NGO issue. We need to uh, address legal status because it is a protection issue if they're not legally registered uh, in Damascus. And for them, it's difficult to do that because if they feel if they go to Damascus, they could be detained or worse. Uh, and finally, I think, uh, which you mentioned it, engaging in long-term national processes. If and when, when the crisis is over and recovery, um, and the recovery, recovery program becomes a priority, you cannot do that without the actors that we have in these synergies because they are the doctors, the teachers, the engineers, the administrators who came from those regions to set up these NGOs. Uh, so that we must find a way of protecting them and getting them engaged in the national process where they won't um, suffer from uh, any sort of abuse or harassment but are, are, are genuinely taken into the, into the uh, national uh, rebuilding process. I'm sure I've got all the time, but uh, many thanks for that. Over. Thank you very much, Ramesh. You've covered um, a huge amount of really important issues there, and it, which complements actually uh, quite a lot of what Virginie um, put forward, particularly in terms of I think some of the interesting ones that were important is the role of the clusters and the fact that you have that translation facility and that the national NGOs or the, the Syrian NGOs are actually doing co-leadership roles in quite a few of your clusters. Um, also some of the, the areas around the fact that they are in these leadership roles and um, putting forward, bringing forward um, their own uh, benefits to the system, which is something that is, so in terms of how we often look at uh, capacity enhancement, which is often a top-down process, there's actually a bottom-up process happening where some of their innovation and the work that they're doing is something that international actors can learn from. Um, and, and also you've put forward a number of very critical challenges there in terms of risk, duty of care and the humanitarian principles. Um, I, we were recently as P2P in um, Gaziantep for, with an IFRC mission. I'd just like to note that on the humanitarian principles there are some interesting um, work that has been done by the, the some of the national NGO um, coordinators that OCHA has employed there together with the national NGOs on the um, principles of engagement, not only in terms of what humanitarian actors can do, but also how they work with some of those difficult, thorny issues with local authorities in other areas, and on the practical application to the humanitarian program cycle. So from a very practical perspective, um, there's some really interesting learnings from Gazi and Tep. I'd like to now move over to Halima. Um, Halima is um, someone who brings a huge amount of passion and a huge amount of experience to this area. She has been someone who's also engaged quite a lot in the Grand Bargain from a, a position of having worked extensively at the local level with local actors um, and working for a local actor herself. And so we're very privileged to have Halima today to, to bring forward that and to complement what um, Ramesh and Virginie have put forward. Halima, how have you supported local actors with, with the GBV subcluster in Somalia that you co-chair, including in areas such as facilitating their voice and perspectives within the broader humanitarian system, as well as supporting their funding and their capacity enhancement? Halima, are you, are you there? Now. We can hear you now, Halima. Please go ahead. Uh, so thank you very much, Ingrid, for giving me this opportunity. It's uh, and I'm privileged to be part of the discussion. It's something that is close to my heart. Um, you asked about the how, what kind of contribution have I brought in into the uh, GBV subcluster, but coordination in general in the country of Somalia. So um, first and foremost, I would like to take this opportunity to commend the work of local actors taking all the risks uh, every, single t every single day in their lives, uh, being uh, at the forefront in terms of not having access 
as far as humanitarian access is concerned, but they are there to just uh, make sure that they support the community. Having said that, um, I will go straight uh, to my point. Um, one is that I have uh, contributed in enhancing the local uh, NGOs participation and core facilitations of the clusters. Um, the GBV subcluster in particular in Somalia is called by, by a national actor, and this is me um, as Halima, and I see this role to be uh, a very privileged role because it, it gives me an opportunity to um, voice out and also be part of the decision making as far as the humanitarian system is concerned. Um, having said that, um, it also uh, gave us uh, an opportunity as local actors to be part of all humanitarian um, system in terms of uh, joint need assessment that are supposed to be done, uh, whatever decision making um, in terms of, because uh, I also have a seat at the HCT, which gives me also a privilege to make sure that knowing which strategic decisions are we taking um, as far as uh, the country is concerned. Um, but also uh, leveraging uh, resources and strengthening local actors', actors capacity. When I, see the, when I say this, uh, in Somalia we have uh, one seat at the pool fund uh, advisory board. Uh, I know that it's not much, but it's something that we would say that we are voicing out uh, to get more seats, uh, which uh, as far as representation is concerned, but also um, strengthening of uh, local NGOs capacity in different and for us. It could be um, enhancing um, knowledge about the GBV, humanitarian principles, and, and more, more capacity uh, in terms of um, advancing themsel their, themselves in terms of proposal writing within the, the GBV subcluster, but also enhancing uh, the, the participants or the members within uh, GBV subcluster in terms of know-how of how they should be dealing with survivors, uh, because it's a very sensitive issue. Um, and, and making sure that they know uh, what kind of mainstreaming abilities would they need for them to mainstream with other 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 clusters as well. Um, and then also uh, strengthening the voices of national actors in coordination forums. Um, this is uh, particularly the Somali aid localization workshop, which is a follow up of the Grand Bagain. We sort of uh, customized it to uh, see how can we move forward. Uh, in terms of Somali local actors um, in contributing to the implementation of the grand bargain. Um, and we had a two-day workshop, basically, and it was very insightful because we brought uh, different local actors across Somalia, in Nairobi in particular, and also uh, the same room we had uh, members of, uh, you know, donor members, um, the government, uh, UN, just to speak about a dialogue basically about the aid localization and what action should we take in order to bring innovative solutions and also make sure that we cooperate better in terms of long, to part, long term and partnership. Um, and then we had a follow up just uh, a week ago uh, of that two day dialogue, uh, which was very in, in, intense in terms of discussions and local actors bringing their frustrations as to how the resources are not enough and, and they are the ones who are taking all the risks. Then we had a week ago a follow-up of how improving aid delivery throughout and transparency, accountability, and risk management. And to be honest, I think this is a very important uh, combination uh, because I think local actors are not um, getting as much resources as required, and this is because of not having risk management systems in place and all that. Yeah. Um, and then we had um, potential outcomes out of this, and this this particular uh, workshop was. Um, was supported by DFID, uh, UK aid, uh, UN, uh, Somali government, and private sectors. Um, so it was a room full of people who are potentially seeing that the, the discussion of the grand bargain is moving somewhere, and Somalia has taken the step to do so. Then why can't we just have a collective, uh, collective uh, concerted effort and see how we can, uh, we can work on this? Um, having said that, um, on, that on those discussions, uh, one of the important uh, elements, I think, was to see how better uh, local actors um, can work, but also reduce and any barriers and what exactly are these things that are preventing donors to directly fund and local actors in particular. Um, and then, um, so what kind of sort of recommendations or on this, um, the, the, the point that I was speaking about is, is also making sure that, you know, you give conducive a space or platforms for local actors to showcase their ability. I think uh, most of the countries, um, and, and I think it is the same thing that is happening in Somalia, 
local actors are not given the platform for them to know or rather showcase what ability they have, which is very unfortunate. We have very dedicated local actors who know the contextuality of the country and who can redirect the decisions. And I think they do deserve to be given this kind of platforms. Um, but also the ability to provide tailored capacity and building, but also mentorship within this process. I think um, if I can give um, an experience, and UNFPA chairs the GBV Working Group and Save Somali Women and Children co-chairs the position. We had very distinctive um, decisions. Um, everybody has a job uh, description and roles and responsibility and the chair didn't have um, a way of, you know, imposing things on me uh, personally and also telling me what to do. I was there to be innovative enough to make sure that I can showcase what I have and bring in a, a positive added value to the table, which is which is something very, very important to me as as, as learning um, as a learning process, which I think should be um, it should it shouldn't be a micromanaging um, opportunities. I think just leave them, tell them what they are supposed to be doing, and then leave them. Let them do whatever they think will be right. Of course, you are there to mentor them, but uh, not micromanaging them. Uh, but also, and uh, it is very important to have trainings and also and meetings happening uh, in local context and, and and using national language. And I think that. In Somalia, it's something that, uh, to be honest, we are missing, and I'm very happy that the other countries, um, like uh, um, Lebanon, um, my colleague just uh, said that um, things are discussed in Arabic, which is very, very important, and, and I think it is one thing that we should uh, learn as Somalis and, and, and make sure that um, we take up um, this an initiative. But also, and uh, the other one is uh, concerted effort between local organizations and, and INGOs in particular. I think the grand bargain um, implementation, if, if we all uh, pray that um, this works out, um, I and international organizations should not see this as an intimidating factor that the local organizations are taking up the space. Um, it is a concerted effort to make sure that we change the social transformation required uh, within our society. And they have a very big role to play in terms of uh, they are our brothers and sisters. We have to hold hands together and make sure that we and give the humanitarian responses required. So it's not a one-sided um, event. It is it's a process that all uh, could join hands together. Um, the UN, the INGOs, the local NGOs, the government themselves, in terms of making sure that the social transformation is done um, in, in all angles of humanitarian. The other one is um, full participation of women. Um, when I see when I say women. Women took the role to change um, unchangeable um, things in Somalia. The Somalia has been uh, without government for the last 25 years. The civil society was, were the front uh, in terms of making sure that, you know, they deliver what the community required at that particular moment. And these are women organizations in particular. And also and changed the kind of... Uh, how Somali used to think in terms of women representation in political participations in, in executive seats. These are women who changed the whole um, ideology of women not, not having a, an important voice within the community, but they changed how the community in general saw women um, in terms of um, and, and preserving 24% of women representation in parliament, which is very crucial. And these were fights that were done by women who are seen as role model in Somalia at the moment. So it is very important that these women that we are seeing are role models. How can we use them? Because the community, the society in general, love them. I mean, they, they are seen as role models. How can we use them to change the social transformation required within a society? And in particular, I'm talking about gender-based violence because it was a taboo and now it's no more a taboo. Why? Because we've engaged as much actors as possible and women were the front leaders on, on this and, and transformation. Uh, but also last one is um, strategic alliance between men and uh, women um, in advocating uh, on women issues. There is tendency of um, thinking that men are not important into the whole process. But I think any, any issue that women have, it's very important and crucial that men should be the central um, actors in terms of changing that transformation. Um, we should engage them as much as possible in different interventions. We make them their friend, our friends 
and also make them that they actually literally show them that they are very important into the whole process. And this is this is something very very important for them to be inclusive into the whole process. Thank you very much, Halima. Um, and you actually covered one of the questions I was going to ask you, um, which was about the issue of GBV and, and how some of the, the, particularly given that this is an, this came up in the previous webinar that we did on um, localization, which we did last year, um, and it came up that sometimes local actors are seen as um, not always being sensitive to GBV and um, wanting to avoid some of these issues. And what you've done is very eloquently put there about some of the work that you have done together with local actors um, and through the GBV subcluster and as Somali women to address some of those. So what I'd like to do now is go to some of the audience's questions because we have 20 minutes um, left for um, for the for the rest of the the discussion um, and and one of the things that we've we've received some questions in terms of how we uh, for 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 a mesh in terms of the issue around the humanitarian principles um, local actors and really touching on this issue of the the focus you had on humanitarian humanity and impartiality as well as the, the whole area of the two-way exchange of innovation. So what would be interesting to hear from you, Ramesh, is, is in, when it comes to so, like humanity and impartiality and, and the focus on principles, what, is, what, is, what do you see has been some good practical examples maybe from, from Gaziantep that we can learn from, but also how do you see that two-way exchange of innovation, that two-way um, process, um, are, are there things that we can also learn from, from um, Gaziantep tip from what has been done there? Uh, yes, I mean, I think, uh, as, as I mentioned before, the, the, the support that, uh, that Archer has provided through this dedicated capacity support uh, NGOs, that, that's uh, um, uh, an, an almost ongoing issue. It's integrated into the work of the, uh, of the organization to support the Syrian NGOs. So you have this capacity, these two, um, these two staff who who understand the context and the language and the actors who are constantly providing that, that uh, service and support. They are the key channel, I think, in terms of the, um, but helping the um, national NGOs to better understand the, the human context in which we work and the frameworks in which we work. So I think it's a bit of an organic uh, thing. I don't think you can say you have to do um, the specific measures you're trying to take. It's basically about getting the right people in the right place and maintaining that there's that communication. So, if, for example, national NGOs have certain questions about some issues or they face a conundrum or a dilemma, they know where to go. They know where to go and have a discussion. They may not always get the right answers because obviously we need to be quite strict about our, our principles. Uh, but they will better understand how, what they can do to change the way they work to uh, adopt some of these, better adopt some of these principles. So I think that's uh, very important. In terms of the actual exchange of uh, innovation, I, this is actually very fascinating because I think there's a lot that we can do that comes out of the grand bargain and out of the World Humanitarian Summit that national, which actually was, a lot of it was driven by national actors and national civil society. Uh, and using that platform, maybe perhaps bring it down to, from a higher global level to a country level, uh, and I, I, I think we need to better do this in Gaziantep as well, uh, creating a subject platform where you can have that exchange of ideas, where you don't necessarily speak about operations, but you have a, a, a policy exchange, an innovation exchange, we can discuss some of these issues because I know that there are, there's a lot of stuff going on in clusters that doesn't necessarily get moved up uh, to a higher level, to the sort of intersectoral level, where there are some actually good ideas both on resilience, on, on, uh, on supporting services and, and things like that, which will actually mitigate humanitarian needs in the future. So you, you avoid that, uh, the annual cycle of providing relief assistance, a lot of the stuff they do can actually mitigate some of needs, especially in areas where you don't have conflict, but you do have displacement and other vulnerabilities. Thank you very much, um, Ramesh. Um, I'd like to now go to Virginie. We have a question for you specifically, um, Virginie, from one of the people in the audience. Um, 
how are the advocacy priorities positioning of national NGOs in Lebanon distinct from international NGOs beyond just advocating for representation, like numbers of seats in HCTs and those sorts of areas? Can you elaborate a little bit about how the complementarities work um, in terms of the international and the national NGOs and, and how that, it, also looking from a system-wide perspective, how, what's, can you actually maybe bring forward if you have an example about where some practical impact has been produced from national NGOs that benefits the broader system in that area? Okay, so I think I don't have um, I don't have general uh, examples which would say basically on this particular topic there are differences or on this particular topic we we all agree. I think it depends again on on each and single topic and that's why we coordinate uh, prior to each and single process to make sure that even though we agree or we disagree uh, we're going to reach uh, the same impact. Now, in terms of um, of different uh, different subjects, I think that, for instance, where we were uh, when we were um, working on on the Lebanon Crisis Response Plan, which was at some point reviewed by by the by the humanitarian country team, um, national NGOs had a certain vision. For instance, in the healthcare, which was very much based on primary health care centers and the national system and some other international NGOs also wanted to add mobile medical units. So the way we were able basically to, to impact is that we advocated for the mobile part, which was the one of the, of the international, and they advocate for ours. So at the end we reached the same objective. So we're trying as much as possible you know, prior to those planning processes and negotiation to have a discussion about what we really want, what, what in the planning process would really you know, reflect our priorities, and then in a way to, to advocate both for, for the same thing. So that's a very sectoral example and very practical example, but I think it sh shows how it can work. Now, if we go to, to the HTT, often at the HTT, the, the issues and, and the points are, are really larger. So we're never into, uh, we have a, a, a position which would be radically different from, from the INGOs. It's more about discussion and in, information sharing. Uh, so most of this, uh, this coordination and this impact really happens at the cluster level, at the working group level, and then it's being reflected at the HTT, which is why it's so important as well to have people representing you um, also at the HTT and in the, in the, cluster, uh, in the cluster system. Um, I also think that uh, beyond the HTT and beyond the sector, if we want to talk about the impact of local NGO, what's also important and that we did not really address till now is the existing coordination mechanisms which are impacting strategies at the local level, the strategies of the municipality, the strategies of the governorates, and there we really have an added value as, as local NGOs because in most of the cases we've been participating to those uh, existing coordination mechanisms for the past 10 years, for the past 20 years, so it is really important there as well to take this into consideration that those local uh, coordination structures can also impact the, the very local strategy which often has um, more effects on the, the affected population than big planning uh, processes. Okay, thank you very much, Virginie. Um, now, Halima, I'd like to come back to you in terms of the, the gender sensitivity. We've had a few questions around that because it's such a topical issue. Um, if you could elaborate a little bit more in terms of what you see as some of the other, I mean, you've talked about the 24% of, of uh, women, you've talked about the fact that it's about men and uh, working together with women and ensuring that that goes forward, but if there's anything else that you would like to bring forward as some learnings that you could think that could be built on um, or applicable in other areas um, that, that has been done in Somalia to bring forward that GBV voice from the local actors um, to, to affect um, a positive impact on the humanitarian response and of course the people. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think one is um, local actors having the strength and also and commitment and trust within uh, 
within their community. I think that is that is very, very important. Um, but the fact that they have the trust, it is something that we can use and, and, and drive some agendas. Um, for example, the sensitive, sensitiveness of the GBV uh, was a taboo in Somalia, but uh, what the local actors have done is they drove a national campaign with the main actors that they know would be respected within the community. One is using the religious leaders, the private sector, um, musicians, uh, they had to do a bit of dramas here and there. So once we see these national leaders and, and role models of women who have been politically engaged within the country, it shows how committed um, the country, uh, I mean the community are in terms of moving forward and let the, this uh, rep an issue be discussed and let it be a household issue, which we want as, as, as actors, as, as service providers. And having said that, but also advocate on the importance of inclusivity of women in the political participation, in attaining that 84% does not just necessarily mean this is just a number that we have uh, beautiful women sitting within the parliament. But what kind of influence do they have in changing, um, uh, I mean, bills, which, which is very, very close to the hearts of women. If, for example, the sexual offenses bill, this is something that is in the parliament now, which is going to be and in, in passed in, 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 in the next in, um, uh, few, few months. And then also we have the FGM bill. So these are, these are bills close to women uh, issues. And this, this is why we had to make sure that these women who are in the parliament, make sure that they play a major role uh, into this. Uh, but also having said that, it is also a shift of seeing um, those victims, uh, survivors of, 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 of gender-based violence, to be seen as, 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 as agents of change and actors as opposed to them being victimized. And I think it is something that within the community, we have and community structures built in, in the IDP and, and camps, and also within the host community. And these are people whom we use uh, to, to make sure that they refer these cases, but also make sure that they have connection and referral pathways with the service providers uh, themselves, where those service providers are the ones that are, issue, uh, are providing psychosocial counseling, me medical and support, but also safe houses. And these safe houses are the ones that, you know, we give uh, temporarily safety for these and, and women who have been violated. But also importantly, when I was, say, when I was talking about men engagement, and this is addressing gender-based violence in terms of uh, change of behavior and norms, uh, so we need to strengthen and, and these actors that we know that they will be contributing. But also just to and probably and Ingrid add on the point of um, my colleague in Lebanon in terms of HCT um, and, and our organization being a member of the HCT. I think our voice are normally heard and that is why we had a follow up workshop or, or a day workshop with DFID and other UN. And this is a voice that is also voiced out by not only the HC in Somalia, humanitarian coordinator, but also and the donors who are sitting within the HCT also, but also the NGO consortium. So this is a collective effort within the humanitarian system to make sure that the localization agenda is had in every forum. Not only, uh, so when I sit at the HCT, I advocate and voice out for the localization. When I sit as the GBV co-chair, I make sure that the resources go to the local organizations. But not only that, in the inter-cluster system itself, I've, when these decisions of priorities are made within the country, for example, if we say Mogadishu is a priority, and then all coordinators sit together to make a strategic decision in terms of who are we supposed to fund on this? Is it Save the Children? Is it an World Vision? So if I'm there as a local actor, I say, okay, so you guys have, have spoken about the INGOs. What about the local NGOs? And now we are seeing more of, uh, you know, a narrow, narrow of thinking uh, in terms of uh, strategizing as a country, even using the pool funds, uh, the Somalia, Somalia and Humanitarian Fund, that we are seeing quite a percentage now moving up in terms of the local organizations being funded. And this is, this is because of the voicing out of, of these forums, uh, voicing within these forums uh, of the humanitarian system. Okay, thank you very much, Halima. Um, Ramesh, I'd like to come back to you. We've had quite a few questions around the issue. You've brought up the grand bargain a number of times, as has Halima and Virginie. Um, we've had colleagues from Haiti who have, were part of a P2P mission that we recently undertook there, who have come forward with some questions. 
as well as others. And, and really it's around some of the commitments under the grand bargain, but also issues around risk management and due diligence. Now you know in terms of Gazian Tep, there's sometimes been criticism about the fact that, oh well, how can you do remote management and ensure that there is um, proper due diligence, proper financial compliance and these types of things, which is not, a, um, it, it's not just there, it's in other locations as well. What would be interesting to hear from you is how have you addressed this issue of um, compliance? How have the international and the national actors worked together, um, including practically to build up that internal capacity and maintain that internal capacity? And also if you can touch on the issue of risk. You've brought up the risks are being passed. This is both in the financial and accountability, but also the security side. What more can be practically done there? Uh, thanks, uh, Ingrid. Uh, excellent question. I'm not sure I have the answers to all of that, but maybe just a few suggestions. I think increasingly in terms of um, accountability, <coughs> um, with the advent of social media uh, and the fact that it's, it's prevalent throughout the communities that we support and serve, uh, that, that's something that we've, we've taken advantage of. Perhaps not strategically, but it's become a, a sort of an integral part of the work, and I think maybe that more can be done on that. Um, in terms of <coughs> monitoring and um, identifying uh, the effectiveness of programming uh, on the ground. We do have third-party monitors who have, uh, who have actors inside the country who can, who can visit the projects, uh, let's say, for example, some of the pool fund projects to, to verify if the work was done, that uh, there's nothing's, gone, uh, nothing's gone missing in, in large quantities, etc. I think we do have to recognize, especially in, re in a remote operation, that you know, sometimes uh, aid will be lost um, along the way, uh, but what, what is, what's the tolerance rate for that? We need to try and address at the beginning so that it, no one is unduly punished or penalized for some of the lost data that, that, that may take place. Now in terms of risk and managing risk, uh, sorry, the, the security risk uh, and, uh, and due to care, um, yeah, that's uh, something that we, need, we I think we need to address um, quite uh, very profoundly because uh, you know, it's unacceptable that uh, doctors and nurses are, are targeted in a crisis, in a, in a conflict like this, and, and many hundreds have died in the course of their work. So they're actually either targeted or they become a, 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 um, an indirect uh, casualty of the, of the conflict. So we have to do, I think, much more at the international level with the political actors to, to bring attention to this. And we're trying at all levels. Syria is, Syria is one of those countries where there's a, a monthly briefing to the Security Council and these, these issues are raised on a monthly basis in terms of protection violations and, and, and uh, risks and threats to uh, humanitarian aid workers. Uh, but we certainly need to do much more in, in terms of raising, that, uh, uh, raising the profile of this problem and uh, trying to find a solution. Uh, it obviously goes back to international legal frameworks and, and protection frameworks. How can we better address them there? Um, so was there, was there another question? I think I may, I may have slipped and I've not written that down. Okay, that's, that's brilliant. I mean, it's a difficult one, um, Ramesh, and I think that you've covered it well. I mean, I think even raising the issue is, is really important. Um, so I'm going to now quickly go to version E here. We have, um, we have about five minutes left before the end of the webinar. So really, if you can, I just want to also highlight that we have a closing poll in the right-hand side. So for all of the participants, if you could please take the time. It takes 30 seconds. It helps us improve our, um, our uh, webinars in the future, which we do every month. Um, so, uh, Virginie, very quickly, if you can take two minutes, what do you think that international donors can do or what can they change in terms of their funding and policies to support local NGOs or the localization of humanitarian response better? What practically can be done? And that's including in terms of looking at where the funding can be best used and how, how not just funding but also the broader support of donors. Yes, thanks Ingrid. So um, I would say that the first thing we can do or we should be, um, the, the system should enable us to do a, as local NGOs is to have a direct access to donor not only at the country level but also at the capital level because if we want them, them to change they need to hear our voice directly. We do have relationship at the country level but very few relationships at the capital level so there I think that really 
our partners should, uh, should enable us to go at the capital level, to meet with the donor, to explain what's our role, what's our added value, and how we can remove some of the barriers to um, a greater uh, localization and local NGO uh, action. Now, in terms of what they can do in practice, well, the first thing, which is very obvious, we heard, uh, we heard about this a lot, is that there shouldn't be restriction on um, if you are a local, a national, or an international NGO. It should be based on your capacity. So we all know that certain, uh, certain donors um, are not accessible for, for a local NGO, and this should be removed. It should be really based on your capacity and on your added value. Um, the second thing is related to the capacity. I think that in terms of capacity assessment, uh, this whole process which is being undertaken by donor is important because we need to be accountable to the people we're working with. So it's okay that you know, your capacities are assessed, but it should take uh, into consideration the reality of local and national NGOs. Sometimes we cannot produce certain documents because they, do, they just do not exist in our country, and this should be a little bit more flexible, a little bit more uh, adaptable. And I think that there are also uh, mechanisms to be, to be put in place that you know, donors can contribute to. You have the country-based pool fund, which are very interesting for us as national and local NGOs, because sometimes we do not want to have this huge and big grant, but we still, want, we still need a certain amount of money, and country-based pool funds are, are more of a flexible uh, mechanism for us to, to access the funding. But really, I would like to insist on this direct relationship with, uh, with donors that is really important if you want to, to impact them in terms of, of policy and, and support. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, um, just Helena, just to give you the final word, um, we've had a few questions about the whole fact that very much, um, and, and also the focus on the top down. A lot of the the work that's been done around localization is, is often focused on how local actors can feed the international system or, or support the international system. Um, is, so really, is it possible to have full engagement of ownership of local actors within the international system if the international system is already predetermined and, and is it possible to drive from the bottom? Can you, do you aware of how that's happened and, and how local systems have actually influenced or changed the international system and, and the international system has adapted to that to, to be improved? Uh, yeah, Ingrid. Um, I think one is, is um, the representation at, at the bottom. Uh, when I say this is the fact that, you know, uh, following, up, uh, following up on the grand bargain, uh, we had discussions uh, within these workshops, and these workshops have been um, the forefronters were the local actors themselves. And now it has given them also an opportunity to sit with other donors to see how we can also comprehend what is happening at the global level. So this is one thing that is a locally driven initiative and not um, something that is coming from the international community um, uh, per se. Um, but also, and, and I, I would also add on the aspect of um, representation at the cluster level. Um, we know that it is something which is predetermined by the UN, particularly at the cluster coordination systems. Um, it's something that is um, standardized, uh, UN being the, the leaders, uh, the chairs. But why can't we have all clusters be co-lead by local actors? Because if you talk of sustainability, I think, and we sit back and say, um, let this be driven by international community, then I think the ultimate and solution or actions that could be uh, forwarded in terms of um, knowledge uh, is, is not happening on the ground. So I think it is a very good opportunity. And this is um, for the GBV and co-chair position particularly is something that is uh, um, congratulated by most of the humanitarian actors. So such opportunities, co-leads of all and, and health, nutrition, education and others should be something that could be changed as a system within the humanitarian and, and in general. But also uh, the aspect of um, risk transfer. I think we should also have um, mechanisms in place um, when we do, when Ramesh just talked of um, risk transfers and particularly those areas that have humanitarian access issues. Uh, we should have mechanisms that we all backfall to. Uh, I believe that the INGOs normally have systems in place 
but I think as local actors is something that we can advocate in terms of policy um, in those in those essence of changing uh, how we do the risk transfers, but also risk assessment um, in terms of accessing funding opportunities as well. Everything seems to be within a system that is already predetermined. Why can't we just make sure that we change uh, the normalization of how we do the normal uh, day job and say we extend this. You cannot ask the same question that you're asking INGO to a local partner. Local partner might not understand what you're talking about and probably they don't have sophisticated systems to follow what the humanitarian system says. So I think we should be very flexible enough to make sure that we engage as, as, as much local actors as possible and that is what we can say from bottom up as opposed to imposing things from from top and, and, and down um, aspect of it. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to say um, that brings to a close this um, discussion on localization um, for this webinar. Our thanks to Ramesh, to Halima and to Virginie for your excellent um, uh, examples uh, which we've learnt a lot from. Just to everyone um, who in the audience, uh, we will also be producing a case study. Recently P2P um, did an interagency mission to Gazi and Tep where we had the privilege of being hosted by the, the OCHA team up there uh, together with many of the national NGOs and of course with the Deputy Regional Humanitarian Coordinator um, to, to observe some of these learnings. Um, we will be producing a case study based on that as well as one of our learning notes. Um, that will, will be coming out soon. Um, and in terms of the summary from this webinar, it will be circulated to all of those who registered and available on our website, um, www.deliveraidbetter.org. Um, so thank you very much and um, I wish you a good day. <laughs>